Hi, everybody. Welcome to uh, the newly named Excess Exceed. I'm Gearface. This is the show where I sit down with an expert that I've tricked into teaching me uh, how to play an Exceed character. Uh, today, I've got D back on the show to talk to me about uh, Guile, uh, Season 3's flattest haired uh, fighter. I think that is objectively true. I think so. Uh, it might actually be one of the only objectively true things we say. Let me Possibly. borrow that to segue into into my disclaimer, uh, as I've as I've been offering before each of our little talks, which is I'm going to present my perspective on this character. My perspective is not the only way to play this character. Uh, Kyle's going to be an interesting example of this, actually, because of how I developed the line of play that I use for him. I'll talk about that in a bit. But basically, don't assume that there's only one right way to play any character. Uh, if the way that I'm presenting or the perspective that I'm offering doesn't match yours or it just doesn't sound like fun, don't do it. Play the game you want the way you want to play it. Play the character the way you want to play them. Uh, try other things. I can always be wrong. Absolutely. And if if you happen to develop a line that we haven't considered, please come on the show. I'm starved for content. Uh, we would we would love to hear about a a line that we don't know about with Guile. There you go. All, All right. right. Let's get so, into it. So uh, on that note, uh, so Guile has an infamous line. Um, which is called, which is affectionately nicknamed Big Hand Guile. Big Hand Guile. Um, Big Hand Guile. This is not the original uh, or expected line. Uh, and just to be clear, line means strategic line. It is an approach you can take when pi piloting character that describes your general expected play patterns and your goals. Um, so the goal of Big Hand Guile is to be over here in exceed mode, and then every single turn you draw at least three cards and strike. And you just don't do anything else. That's that's your that's what you do every turn. You draw three and strike. And because you're striking, uh, and, you're never discarding anything, and you just have a bigger and bigger and bigger hand until you have your whole deck. Exactly. Yeah. Okay. Rules rules minutia here, which is not so much minutia for for Guile and for a few other characters, is that uh, hand size is only checked if you draw a card at the end of your turn, and you don't do that during strikes. Which means that if you draw three and strike, well you just keep getting more cards in your hand every single turn until you can end up with a hand of, like, 20 cards. Right. Uh, naturally, you're probably spending at least one of them on your strike, whether you're setting one or two, depending on if you're setting an EX. Because also, the larger your hand, the likelier you are to have EXs. Um, but nonetheless, your hand size will generally increase if you're taking this approach. Uh, just indefinitely. So would you, would you characterize the, the big hand guile line as basically being, like, uh, a, a sudden kind of mid-game shift into a rushdown play style? Like you start out kind of turtling up and, and getting ready, and then when you exceed, it's just all aggression all the time? Yeah, exactly. Gotcha. So the okay. front half of the game, when you are this character, you are playing relatively slow tempo, you are focusing on building gauge, you need three gauge, and you generally want to also have some some tools that are movement tools, and we'll go over the kit in a little more detail later. Okay. But uh, basically, what you don't want to do is you don't want to be over here and be, all right, I'm ready to be super aggressive. And then what? your opponent goes, cool, I'm ready to shut down all of your offense because I have speed boosts out, and I'm at you know range range 8, and I have a projectile that beats yours, which isn't right. very likely, but yeah, there's, there's one or two characters you can do that. Sure. Um, or you don't have any projectiles because you threw them away on your, on your early game stuff. Um, like there's there's a lot of ways you can kind of shoot yourself in the foot, and then you go, oh, I was all gung ho to get started, and then I actually had no fuel in the tank, right? Um, or you know, no tires on the wheels, or however you want to put it. Right. Like things were not ready, um, even your though hand, I was. Your hands was. weren't your hands weren't as big as you thought they were going to be when you flipped. Exactly. Right. Um, so so since you developed the big hand guile line, has it kind of become the default way to play guile, or do the two kind of coexist? They, they they coexist and in large part I think the the big hand guile is like infamous because it's it's spectacular right it's yeah. it's big it's flashy it's extreme right and also I I put out a bunch of videos about it so it's hard yes. to miss if you're looking for for content about Ixie guile yes guile um, versus the world which I I will link in the description if anyone's interested thanks um, but yeah so it, it's a big thing. Um, and it's also a thing that teaches a lot of people about the hand si about the hand size check um, because a lot of people don't realize that's how it works until they go, wait, Guile does what? Right. Wait, why does why does that work? Right. Oh, really? Okay. Um, and so it sticks in the memory. Um, I, I would actually, I'd, I would say, I, it, I don't know that's ever become his dominant line. However, okay. Um, 
and and part of that is at least not from what I've seen in, in high level play. Uh, part of that is because like while that is very fun, it's not always correct, and it, against many opponents, it's not. How should I put it? Uh, you need to use this and play defensively so much that you can't afford to spend the time in the gauge to do this Okay. and roll your momentum forward because in those two turns where you go, I'm spending two gauge, I'm exceeding. Starting next turn, my ball is going to be rolling, but I still need to land successive hits. Your opponent can do something that says, actually, you're shut down for most of the rest of the game. Right. Okay. Um, and I have seen and experienced this, uh, especially with characters from Guilty Gear Strive, where they have a little bit of gauge and they go, oh, I see you're taking a turn off. Excuse me while I kill you. Right, right. right. Uh, like they, so, they can so, do some horrifying things. So Big Hand Guile is a, an option that he has that you... It, it isn't an option that you can necessarily just decide to play at random like it, it requires a lot of setup it's a it's a separate line of play from his more traditional one but it is something that he can do that is worth considering and talking about it's not it's not just a meme but it's not right. the way to play guile right okay um yeah and it and it is it is fairly powerful and especially i'll say it's powerful against players who struggle to deal with opponents who can threaten everything at once right uh and that's what guile does is guile says okay I'm going to go to range two and strike. Uh, and actually, let's let's now start talking about his kit. Well, what is what is Guile threaten at range two? Surely it's not that scary, right? Um, well, let's see. He has flash kick, uh, which at range two beats assault and sweep. Yep. And focus. Yep. And spike. Yep. Hmm. Most things. Yeah. What, what does it what does it lose to? I guess I guess you can cross away from it. Cross and do two um, damage, and then I, and then he still gets the follow up positioning. Sure, and um, I wonder if Guile has a good projectile to capitalize on cross. Well, gee, yeah. If only he had something to do against you after you played cross. Yeah, um, wild. Yeah, well, ooh, would you look at that? So he's going to hit you for four or six damage, uh, and then probably move in a little bit. Mm -hmm. um, but that's okay. He doesn't have to have that. Maybe he doesn't. Maybe he only has this boost that says close to take another action. Right. Um. Uh, if you are not at range one. So if you're at range four or greater, this is close to you take another action. Okay. Which and you can you say, oh, you, you crossed, crossed away. Out. Sure. That's fine. Let me go back in. So now we're at range two again and I'm striking again. Right. Uh, and so if you're not playing the flash kick side, well, okay, let's look at what this one says. Uh, this beats sweep if it's critical. Uh, yep. It beats focus always because you can retreat at range two to range three. Yep. Um, it's got a nice little discard effect. So it's it's nasty against block. It's also kind of expensive to block. Uh, doesn't, doesn't beat assault. Unless it's CX. Yep. Uh, and, you know, also doesn't beat cross. Uh, but that's still a, a decent number of things. Uh, and if you were to put, you know, for example, plus two speed on this, uh, then now it would actually suddenly kind of beat everything. Now it's on curve, yeah. Um, this turns into a seven power speed six uh, range two that retreats to range three if they play focus. So it just beats everything. Everything, um, pretty much. Yep. Yeah. How about that? That's so, a. So so at range two, I've got a very stable uh, slow card that beats a lot of beats other slow cards. Like it's kind of a slow mid speed. It's like a or a safe mid speed mm -hmm. or something like that. And then I have a very, mm -hmm. very powerful mid speed that doesn't lose to a lot of things anyway. Yeah. Yeah. Mid speed with slow properties. Mid speed without slow properties. Right. Um, OK, well, how about how about this? Ah, another mid speed uh, yep. without slow properties. This has no defenses at all. Yep. Um, but it ignores guard, which means that yeah, it beats anything slower than it. Yep, and that's, that's a, a mid big, speed. That's a big scary sweep effect on it too. With the the critical. oh man, this is unbelievably punishing to land the the, the two random discards. You go okay, my, I play this. My opponent plays block, and I win the strike because yes. they now have to discard two random cards and pay two force to take no damage and get their block to gauge. That's incredibly expensive. Yeah, that's dangerous. Yep, and you go okay. Well, you know how how much of a difference does it really make for them to have two fewer cards in hand? Well, you're Guile. You have more cards than them already. Right. If they, if they also have to rip, rip apart their hands uh, because they couldn't defend against your mid-speeds, that's fewer options they have to defend against your unrelenting assault of... Well, maybe assault, maybe not. Anyway, your unrelenting <laughs> attack, barrage right. attacks, forge doors. Uh, and that's true whether or not you're an Exceed book. So I'll talk about the basic ability as well as being something that you need to think about how strong it actually is because it's right. better than it probably looks. But yeah, so okay. So yeah, yet another punishing mid-speed. Fine and good. Um, okay. Okay, we finally got to the card that isn't a mid-speed. Uh, it's instead speed 6, so it's on curve at 2 and above curve at 3. 
yep. but looking in particular at the range 2 mix up, he's got beats cross, loses to all the slows, beats all the slows, beats all the slows, beats all the slows. Yep. Uh, hey, look, he has the mix up and he has a very scary side of it because the fact is, you only have two crosses, right? Yep. If, if you're most characters, um, you might have some things that are speed six in your kit that aren't actually cross. And that's why it's nice for him to have a few other ways to deal with cross, like the speed bonus I mentioned earlier. Um, but you only have two crosses. If he calls those out, well, you're out of the things that deal with these things at range two, right? In most cases, and now you're losing every strike for the rest of the game. That's a slight exaggeration, but like it, it's horrific. You don't want to be in that situation. Yeah, having this um, many this many mid speed or mid speed like attacks means that that he can he can eat you alive with some with a few strikes. It seems like. Yep, and if you commit really heavily to going, okay, I I desperately need to evade all this stuff. I'm going to play my cross or play ex dive and then you find out that actually he was just playing something really low commitment maybe flash kick maybe he was initiating with like a focus even he's just like okay you can do that fine and good i still have all these tools by the way right you're gonna eat them later like and mm. also the abundance of mid speed means that he can often use them for utility so like he'll use flash kick even if he doesn't necessarily need the mid speed roll he'll play it at range where it says i have one armor and i'm moving one Right. So you can shoot me with some projectile and I'll still move in. And I'll get positioning that I want, sure. Exactly. Or you can play Sonic Boom at, at long range uh, as a true projectile. I've played Sonic Boom at range one occasionally when I go, I need a five card repos a five guard reposition that says that I win the next strike. Yeah. Uh, and this does. This says this does that. This says I get to choose where I'm standing in for the next strike, and then I will win that strike because of that. Okay. Um not that's a niche usage, but my point is that uh, in particular these two cards. He he can spend as utility functions because he's he's not out of mid speeds. Right. So like he he still has this the, nonsense. There, there are other situations in the game where, for example, if you're at range three and we're we're just talking about like normals, man. If you run suddenly run out of uh, both copies of assault, all of a sudden your opponent's like, okay, never play anything that loses to sweep. Or I'm sorry, loses to spike. Got it. With yeah. with guile, it's like, all right, I've run myself out of one powerful mid speed option at range two. It'd be a real shame if I had more of those somewhere in my kit. Yeah. It's like, oh, I'm out of spikes. Well, that's okay. I still have spike. Well, right. I'm out of that. All right. Well, I still have spike. I still, oh, have, I still spike have spike. spike. Okay. Right. Um, you still have mid speeds. Um, now, I kind of alluded to Sonic Boom being a mid speed. I also have described a few other ways. This card's pretty flexible and it has some unusual purposes because it is the projectile in the kit. And projectiles often look a bit different from, how, from other card types because they don't interact the same way with uh, normals. Sure. So at range three, however, this is a mid speed. This beats all the counterattacks at range three. Yep. Um, it you beats can, sweep, it beats focus. You can move out of the way of them, yeah. Yep, works just works just like spike at range three, where okay. it, it wins the strike. So it, it, um, it kind of barely interacts with the um, the melee meta. It's mo like most of its range band is overlapping with, with the fireball meta, but that range three is where you're playing assault and spike and sweep sometimes and things like that. So that that is yep. relevant. Okay. Yep. And at four, it is also a mid speed that beats focus. I would argue it doesn't beat focus at or so it doesn't beat sweep at range four though. Um, that movement is mandatory. So at range four, you're going to go to either range two, three, five, or six. Right. And, uh, and if you go to range five or six, well, you just spent this. Yeah, you better have another. You're gonna one. have to spend. Yeah, like you're gonna have to either have another one, or you'll boost cross, or you'll boost this, and that's all. That's spending resources you didn't want to, right? Right. Part or of the you reason take, you play this is you want the after, or you take six. Uh, yes. From from the sweep, <laughs> yeah, which you probably don't yeah. do, which you don't generally want to do. Six six in a card, and the opponent gets a gauge. Is a yeah. You go okay. That's not yeah. Choosing to eat a sweep is a tall order, right? Hard to do. Uh, let me talk a little bit about uh the other mid speeds. Mm -hmm. Um. Yeah, so so here's the biggest dumbest flash kick. Um, it is it is just ultra flash kick. Like to, yep. you know, you can look at these and go, oh, well, it has yep. three more power. It has one more armor. It has one more guard. Yep, one more Everything push else. and one more after. Yep. Like it's it. What if every number except range was up? Yep. Um, and and speed, same speed, same speed. Um, yep. Yeah. Still, still fundamentally, just oh, this is a mid speed with the property of a slow where it. Trades against things like assault and dive, posi positioning permitting, um, and crushes anything slower than it for horrifying damage. Yep. Um, but at a fairly high expense. Um, I 
do not personally play a lot of Flash Explosions, uh, but I have seen them win a lot of games. It's not a bad card at all. Yeah. Um, I, I tend to use this for big hand Gaia shenanigans or boost it for memes. Um, yeah. And I'll talk more about that boost in a minute because Guile's boost kit is like the entire first line of play for Guile. So I'm going to have to talk about that entirely as its own thing. Definitely. All right. Last attack. Um, hey, look, a mid speed. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> at, at ranges two, three, and four, this beats anything slower and it, and it loses to anything that outspeeds it, usually. Yep. Uh, so, any normal that outspeeds it. Yep. So again, we're uh, projectile, but way, way shorter range of projectile. And this is, this is way more into the. You know, we're talking about two and three, not just three from uh, Sonic mm -hmm. Boom. Where'd Sonic Boom go? There it is. Um, there. But not obviously uh, six, seven, eight either. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yeah, you're not generally going to be sitting at full screen. If you are, you have your emergency button to deal with it, which is Sonic Boom. Right. You have a couple of tools to get out of it other than that. Um, one of them being the universal uh, boost on cross, which is just run. Yep. And then the boost over here roll, which is a close to taking their action if you're at extreme range. Yep. Or just moderate range, you know, range four greater. But uh but yeah, Sonic Hurricane is a pretty legitimate attack at uh two through five. It is a, a, a scary mix up option at two and three. Uh if you manage to have the opponent pinned at range five, it can just be a oh, oops, take eight damage. I decided to spend some gauge and deal some damage and you couldn't do anything about it. Right. Right. Uh, that is not usually the case you're going to end up in. Uh but the other nice thing about this, after you move up to three means that you go from range five to range two. Right, right. This this after means that you will be in the range that you in the position that you want to be in afterwards, because uh, you also don't need to worry about reprisal because your opponent is done. Right, and uh, and you're probably um, you're this this is probably going off, right? Like it's got five guard on it. You're likely to get that movement, and that costs like if you're paying three force for it, it'd be it'd be difficult. Like three, I mean, rather three gauge, um, to remove up to three. There's some equity there as well. It's not like it, it's yes. you want the eight damage, obviously, and you're probably going to get the eight damage. But the there's a big kicker on that. It seems like, yeah, that 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 afternoon is extremely useful. It's 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 the reason you go. Okay, well, it's not that bad to play this, even though I value my gauge for a lot of things and I value this boost in a big way. Right. Um, right. This is still going to give me the follow up that I want, even if the opponent blocks it, because if I'm sitting here at range five and striking, they're going, okay, it's Sonic Boom or Sonic Hurricane. You know, I'm I'm going to play a block or do something else to mitigate these options. Right. Um, but yeah, the uh, the other notable thing I will say is that this is this is a kind of a classic exceed card shape uh, that we call a cross catcher. It's it's a thing that from range two uh, trades up against cross as yes. a as kind of a slow a, as a counterattack, um, and generally it has some other kind of bonus punish on top of that, which depends on the character. So in this case, it is a thing that says, "Oh, you wanted to leave range two. I'm so sorry." I'm going to trade up by five, and we're still at range two. Right. Uh -huh. So, so th this is this is like a projectile Tatsu. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, that's good. That's a good way to think of it. Okay, I can yeah, see so that. It, share, it, it shares the property of this card in beating cross, just in um, in very different ways. Right. Yep. Where he goes, I win the speed tie, or I massively trade up. But they're both things that beat cross, uh, which is. Notable for being the normal that is going to deal the most efficiently with all of with, his mid speeds. With almost everything else, sure. Oops, let me do that back there. Um, is it mm -hmm. just before we continue on? Because I'm I'm noticing some some commonalities with some of these cards, and I I remember this from a conversation about the fireball meta. Five guard is kind of standard for a slow projectile, so that it can eat another projectile and hit back. Correct. Yeah. And yeah. and it most... means you can so so a fast projectile is going to deal. Up to three damage, not usually four. Right. And fierce plus three is five power, right? It is still not uh, enough. Yeah, so you have five guard and you go, okay, they can throw a fierce on it. I still guard through their fast projectile. Right. And most, I, I've not gone through the cards, but is it common for, uh, for projectiles with five guard to also have four speed? That seems fast. I guess that's why it's an ultra. But yeah, no, that's fast. Okay. So, uh, and in general exceed terms, at four speed, five guard is the number that you go, oh, that's that's plenty. You don't need more than that. You don't need more than right. that, sure. Oh, sure, because, like I mean, Six would be excessive. Right, <laughs> like, uh, at four speed, like, I guess, uh, if, you're if your opponent's initiating into dive, that's five damage, you're taking the five guard. Okay, I see what you mean. Um, exactly. Right. Okay. Gotcha. You, get, you get popped by dive, you get popped by EX assaults, 
Like most most things that are most typical things that are going to be faster than it are not going to deal enough damage to break it. Okay. So, you know, five is a very stable guard number. Um, much like how six guard is sufficient at speed two, where you go, yep, that's right. that's fine. It's probably going to be fine. Um, it's usually going to be fine unless they can throw extra power on to literally sweep. Sure. Right. Um, or there's someone like Soul and they just start dealing seven damage every turn. But okay. you know, so, so sh- for everything. So short of yeah, short of like donkey kick uh at, at range two, mm-hmm. um initiating Sonic Hurricane five guard is gonna be enough. That that is good to know yep. and good for me to remember. Yep. Yep, yep. Yeah, generally you can kind of go the uh, so guard descends as speed ascends, right? So you go at speed one focus has seven defenses, at speed two, sweep has six defenses. At speed three, Spike has four defenses. And then above that, there isn't any. Right. And so when you're above that kind of defense curve, you go, oh, well, I have a speed three with five defenses, so it's a little better. And then I have a speed four with five defenses, which is which is great. Which is, like, which I don't is need to worry better. about this card. Sure. Yeah. Okay. I get you. Yep. Uh, it's also why uh, it's very putting defend onto assaults makes it extremely reliable, where you go, right. oh, now anything faster than it isn't going to stun it. Right. Okay. Um, Anything with an asterisk, of course, you know, exceptions exist. Of course. Situations exist. Of course. All right, but that, that that's a good kind of rule of thumb when I'm evaluating kits to keep in mind. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. All right. Uh, and speaking of evaluating kits, let's talk about the other half of this kit, which is a huge, huge part of guile gameplay and a huge part of the strengths. Uh, right. The boosts. All right. Um, uh, I'm going to speak facetiously for a moment here. Uh, like every character in Exceed, he has the same boost you would expect. He is light. Uh, he's fierce, uh, and he has defense. Right. Uh, nothing unusual, nothing out of the ordinary. Um, these don't quite look the same, though. Uh, and he also has some other shenanigans. Now, I've talked about Roll. Roll is his, like, it, it's 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 an amazing movement tool. It's also on what is generally considered his best attack. Uh, the reason that this is his strongest attack is because, as I said, it has all those properties before, and also this boost exists. Preemptive strike, right. So, before I talk about neutral, uh, I'm going to talk about payouts. So, this boost, preemptive strike, plus two speed now strike, says I'm converting a bunch of resources, a force, an ultra, maybe a critical, uh, yep. to say, I have some unbeatable nonsense, you're screwed. Right. Uh, it might be this. It might just be spike. It might be a speed five spike. It might be a speed six ex spike. Uh, but you're just, you're saying, all right, I'm just gonna win the strike. Uh, I'm paying a lot for it, but like you're you're probably not gonna be able to contest it. Right. Um, now there are times you posture where you actually don't have a thing and you need your opponent to think that, but usually you're gonna say, all right, I'm actually committing this because I actually have the thing I need to pay out with. Right. The the uh, now strike part of it. It's not like when you can you can boost light. And say, "All right, hit me," uh, and hope yeah. they don't. This is you. You are committing by playing this card to playing something. Exactly. Gotcha. So, like, okay. you're not going to boost this and say, "Yeah, it, you, you." It's not remotely a defensive option. Okay. Um, whereas light actually is generally a defensive tool. Um, right. Like speed is generally more defensive. Um, but preemptive strike is saying, uh, "I'm, I'm, I'm going to be aggressive and and preempt whatever it is that you're doing." Right? It's okay. If you started a boost war, I'm ending it. Right. Uh, if you didn't, I'm just going to prevent you from doing something like crossing out. Uh, the speed threshold here that matters, by the way, is six, because once again, cross, and then a decent number of other options, but cross as the normal option at range two. You go, oh, I'm at range two. Oh, what's the fastest thing my opponent can have? If, and it's probably cross. And you go, all right, then I need speed six. So four yep. plus two. Yep. That's why this threshold matters. Yep. Um, and, and, and at this point, we, what we are talking about is basically just like, how much are you willing to pay to beat it? Because as you mentioned, even without this boost, this is already beating everything slower than it. It's a mid-speed. But mm-hmm. this is a lot to to pay to win a strike. Mm-hmm. Uh, a yeah. seven damage is a, is probably worth a payout, right? Like that is that is a, yeah. a hefty chunk of damage. Yeah, yeah. The way the way that you can afford to play this is that you're up enough on resources that you can do this, and either the game has ended because you were waiting for the win it would end the game. Or, more commonly, you know that after you land it, uh, maybe your opponent blocked it, maybe not, but more importantly, you still have enough resources to play. You didn't actually throw everything at this. Right. You paid an ultra, you paid a force, you probably paid a gauge, and you played another card from hands. Yep. Uh, and that's a ton of resources, and it's fine. It didn't dent your economy because you're Guile. Right, okay. Uh, 
Like you can actually afford to do that. So, um, so when when other characters are talking about committing resources, and, and when Guile is talking about committing resources, that's a different metric that we're talking about. Um, yes, that he he just has so many more again because of his character ability, um, yes. which we'll get to. But he he is mm -hmm. just so far ahead of the resource game all the time that he can look at what another player would see or another character would see as like a big expenditure and be like, meh. Is that is that yep. right? Okay, cool. Yeah, just shrug it off. I mean, look at the size of his shoulders. You can shrug off whatever you want. <laughs> uh, yeah, that was pretty bad. Anyway, uh, but, but yeah, so no, and notably, there are two different shapes of that advantage, which is his basic and his exceed mode. Right. The exceed mode, as I mentioned, Big Hand Guile, where you're just drawing three and striking every single turn, uh, is, oh, I should have mentioned, where you are spending one gauge every turn to yes. draw three and strike. Yes. Uh, that is how this actually works. Let's, let's look at this wording very carefully. When using a change card's action, the first gauge spins generates two additional force. So if you change cards, spending one force from gauge, you have actually spent three force. Right. That's that's how this works. If you pay one force from gauge and one force from hand, then you have actually paid four force. Four force. Right. Right. Gotcha. Uh, and so it, it scales up from there, but less efficiently, which means most turns you're only going to pay one gauge. You might throw away a few extra cards from hand if they're not useful to you, as, as you would in any ordinary change cards action. Right. But you're not gonna you're not usually gonna spend two gauge because if you spend one gauge this turn and one gauge next turn, that's three force this turn three force next three force next turn if you just send them both this turn it's just four force right okay um, and and so i'm i'm probably spending one gauge per turn when i'm striking his big hand guile um not counting my crits and i'm i'm going to be if i'm critting as well and i'm only getting one gauge back per strike i'm going to be gauge negative so i mm -hmm. need i need some kind of gauge fixing mm -hmm. um and i'm so I'm I'm wondering like like how like I guess I guess part of it is like how long does Big Hand Guile need to sustain that offense before his, his opponent's dead? Um, mm -hmm. so so maybe it's it is that part of it that you you exceed when it is time to to close the game or is this something that he actually can do all game if he needs to or most of the game if he needs to? Well, uh, so here's a couple things. You don't have to spend every turn drawing three and striking. You can always spend a regular old-fashioned turn just doing something else. Mm -hmm. And if you're not over hand size, then it's not even a problem, right? Because you're not going to have to discard. Uh, you can also just initiate a strike and, you know, skip your hand size strike that way without spinning the gauge. So if you're not convinced that you're going to have the gauge after your next strike, don't spin the gauge first. Just go, okay, I have one gauge left. I can't afford to be at zero gauge, so I'm going to just strike this turn. And then if that means I hit and next turn I have two gauge, great. That means I have a cushion, right? Gotcha. You can build up a cushion that way. Okay. Uh, the other the other factor in how exceed mode guile keeps rolling, uh, and this is, I have mixed feelings about about how I talk about this because I think this is like a very strong component of the line. I also think it is an extremely predictable component, and people are often, you know, increasingly aware of it and are ready to deal with it. Uh, it's this boost. Oh, it's the shades. Okay, so, so it's the shades. Here's, here's your crit fixing. Okay, so you just get it for free. Got it. Okay. Yeah. You put shades on and you go, actually, I'm not paying gauge for critical ever. Right. So now you are actually uh, gauge neutral as long as you're hitting and you can sustain that. That that actually completely answers my question. And and yep. so you're saying because people are aware of this and they're able to play around it, this is actually maybe a weakness of the line? Uh, it's a knowledge check. Okay. It's It's not so much that it is a weakness. It is that... It, it is going to be incredibly strong against people who don't know what's coming and against people who do it's a it's a it's a tech tax it is a okay they're probably going to save their tech to get rid of this boost right they're probably going to find ways to make sure and push through a stun if they can't do that right okay. like they're going to do something to deal with it does does uh, this stun count reactively as well if i play grasp and then get hit by sweep am i stunned and this goes away yes okay good to know yeah, which is another reason that like once this is out, it also kind of limits your play patterns where it, you go, okay, I got to be very confident if I'm playing the fast side of the mix up. Right. Because if I play the fast side of the mix up and they play a counter attack, I'm going to get stunned. Right. Right. You go, okay, that's it's a little dangerous. It's a little dicey. Now you can deal with that in one way by having two pairs of shades on. Another one. Yep. Yep. Um, this gives you four guard, which is a lot harder to break through just any given attack. And then if you EX on top of that, that gives you one armor five guard, Six, which means even which most counter attacks. Sure. Okay. Like you, you you can throw EX assault into sweep and you're not stunned. Yes. Got it. Um and that's horrifying. And you're likely to have more EXs because you are drawing so many cards. So so that isn't as unlikely as it sounds to just be able to pull out of your out of your hand. Yes. 
Got yeah, it. yeah. Exceed mode guile uh, and big hand guile is going to have exe ex attacks very consistently. Okay. Because you start to get to a 10, 11, 15, you know, 18 card hand, and you go, well, I, I by definition, have to have at least one EX in here. Right. It would be weird. If I, something would be very wrong with maybe Tabletop Simulator if I didn't. Right. Right. You get okay. to 16 cards in hand, and if you don't have an EX, something has gone horribly wrong. Right. Um, with the universe. Because you only have 15 cards in your deck, like right. 15 unique cards in your deck. Right, of course. Mm -hmm. Okay, so yep. so that 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 that's uh that answers my question about about big hand. Yeah, guile. in theory, this solves all your problems. In practice, right. it is your opponent's job to solve this problem. Sure. Okay. Um, and so I I will commonly actually not throw the shades out. Uh, the other thing about this is that once you're in exceed mode, if you're if you're in big hand guile mode and you're over hand size by three or more cards, uh, you can't take a turn off to these shades. Right. Which means that if you really are going to have shades out, you need you need to commit two separate turns, probably. Right. One for the first one that they tech, and then one for the one that gets to stay out. Right. Um, like you need to commit probably at least two turns to just putting shades out, which is two turns of the opponent's does, I uh, you know in theory whatever they want. The first one they're tacking, the second one they do whatever they want. Sure. Um, and and over the course of like prob like maybe before you exceed or at least before you've started your engine when you've exceeded, like like that that's a a delicate timing. Because you don't want to do this, I, I assume, you don't want to do this so early that you're giving them more opportunities to beat it before you exceed. But when you've mm -hmm. exceeded, it's time to go. Like, you're trying to kill guys now. So so when exactly would you play this? Is that part, I guess, is that yeah. part of the problem? That is part of the problem. The, I mean, the answer is you go, okay, do I know that barring extraordinary circumstances, I am not going to get stunned on the next two two strikes? You go, okay, then I can play this. Where like you're at range one and you're holding sweet focus flash kick. And you're like, all right, cool. Unless my opponent has some character specific shenanigan, unless they're standing ready with, you know, area shift and scramble and an extra gauge. Right. Like the chances of them stunning me out of this are very, very low. Right. Okay. Um uh, and you throw it out because you know that then when they strike, you have something to respond with and you're comfortable with it. Where you go, all right, well, I just have my crit flash kick, or I have my focus, or I have my sweep, or I have my block. Right. Uh, I range four or greater. Block is perfectly fine. Where you go, okay, I can probably pay force on this because I'm going to have all the force I want. Um, I'm just not going to take damage. I'm certainly not going to get stuns. Um, but yeah, getting getting your shades out and then and then maintaining them is non-trivial. And so I, I would I would say like this fixes all your problems, but don't assume it's going to be around every game. Right. Um, it's not. Don't free. assume you'll get to keep it. It's right. not free. It's not guaranteed. Uh, and so a lot of times the way that you'll need to deal with your your gauge negative pattern is occasionally take turns not using your ability, occasionally right. play strikes not critting, you know, and, and rely on other things occasionally. Right. It, it's uh, interesting. During the, the Viper lesson uh, that you gave me a few days ago, D, you were talking about how important the value of a turn is for rushdown characters. And this is a situation mean. where you are actively working to become a rushdown character and making your turns matter a lot. So sort mm -hmm. of like by default, this is a tax. This is a difficult thing for you to do because you're trying to become something where every single turn is is crucial to your engine. Yes. Okay. And then once once you have because once you have become a rushdown character, you're not taking a turn off to boost shades. Right. Right. Like except right. in very unusual circumstances. Um, uh, like, yeah, it, it it is possible. You know, asterisk on everything. I've I've done it. I mostly done it in situations where. I actually fell behind after exceeding where I was whiffing. My opponent was ready for things. They were able to set up, set up on me. And I went, oh, okay. I'm down to a low hand size. But I finally have all of my you know, counterattacks, my sweeps, my focuses, my flash kicks. Now I can boost the shades, keep it for a little bit. And once I land a hit, then I'll have gauge again and I'll get to be a, you know, big hand guile again. Okay, so it's almost cool. always a long-term investment. And in the short term, it's almost a liability. Yes. Got it. It, okay. is, it, is, it is saying... Okay, here's this thing that I clearly really want. Uh, what are you going to do about it? And right. they're probably going to try to do something about it. And it and it isn't even like with um, extreme example this, which is untackable anyway. But way of the warrior on Ryu, which is also we call tech bait. That at least will go away after a strike. That at least like at some point you will pay this out. This is saying yes. any time between now and the end of the game, getting rid of this will hurt me. In a way yes. that, that that is not true of almost any other tech bait that I can think of, uh, at least from the characters that we've talked about or the characters that I know. Okay, that's so that is right. that is a huge target. That makes sense. Yeah, you can't you can't poor man's it, right? Like you can, you know, one one of the forms of tech available to every character is poor man's tech. Uh, at least that's what we used to call it, where you are striking with a whiff, where you go, okay, I'm at range one, I'll play block. Right. 
right? And I go, yeah, your your big attack hits me. I'm a little sad, but your boost is gone now. Right. Right. right well, right. that doesn't work here. Right. Uh, it doesn't go away, and it also doesn't cost him anything to sustain. This is not like a Vega boost. Right. Uh, Vega pays for his, pays up and knows. Uh, Kyle does not. It's free. Got it. Yep. Um, but yeah, so shades are good, but you know, the more the more you crutch on them, the more your opponent is going to to decide that they will never let you have nice things. Right. Um, right. And and mm-hmm. it will over the course of the game, it will be increasingly apparent that it is in their best interest to deny you these shades. Oh yeah. Okay. Yeah. Like it's often if you can get at least one strikes worth of I, my critical actually mattered, it was probably still worth it to play. Sure. Right. If you land a, a crit flash kick, you went okay. Well, I played this. I paid this out from hand instead of spending one gauge. That saved me a gauge. Yep. On my crit. That that's cool. Like that that was probably worth doing. Yep. That's still good. Um, that's still pretty good. Like, so it's it's still generally fine to get at least one strike worth of value out of it. But you know, the more the more the more you get out of it after that. The, the more it's grinding your opponent into the dust. Got it. Like, it it's going to be a problem for them if they let this sit out and you actually get full value out of it. Okay, that makes uh, sense. Strike after strike. So you, you were, that was a, a kind of a long rabbit hole that I, I helped facilitate there. You were talking about payouts with uh, yeah. with this card back here, and I, I'm sorry for, for distracting from no, that. No, no, you're fine. I mean, the next the next card I was going to talk about was this boost, oh, and, and okay. we, you just jumped to it early, where I was like, yeah, the other thing you need to know is that how you handle your your criticals is where a lot of damage comes from because uh guile's critical effects which is written on 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 his cards as you can clearly see is a plus two power a lot of times plus yes. two power plus two, plus two, power, two power. power yep and then this other thing which is uh plus two your opponent's cries you know, you yeah. can, like plus two sadness <laughs> yeah uh it's not it's not actually two power but it's two random cards and it tends to hurt worse than plus two power actually right um but yeah so like in that in that sense, this is almost plus two guard plus two power, right? Because that's that's what you're getting on your specials most of the and time. It's at least what you're threatening. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Got it. Um, okay. So so that you know. that that is going to facilitate the shape of pretty much all of your attacks going forward as soon as you play it, and this is mm-hmm. going to facilitate very strongly your next attack. Yes. This okay. is when you go. Okay. You know, I have the gauge to crit. I need to make a payout, or I'm ready to make a payout. And you do a thing, or if you and and you can still throw mix-ups with this, where you can say, "I'm actually, we're at range two, and I look like I'm playing the big dumb thing that you have to block." So I'm going to play the thing that you really can't afford to block. Sure. Um, right. Like there, there are situations where you can make mix-ups out of this, but there's still going to be mix-ups that were that were, you know, you're you're never going to make a play that isn't very punishing. It's just which kind of punishing play did you make? Right. You know, which mid speed did you like to play today? Right. Uh, you have choices. Um. But it's far too expensive to throw it out on... In most cases, it's far too expensive to throw it out as a diffusal tool. You would rather diffuse things with lower commitment stuff like block focus or flash kick, where you just go, I'll lose a little less, I pay a little resources, and then next turn I'll, I'll come back in and, and kill you. Okay, that makes uh, sense. So this is, this is a, a... Not only is it a be sure you win tool, it's a be sure you win hard tool. Yeah. Okay. And it's not too hard to do that because plus two speed now strike on mid speeds is horrifying. Is a lot, yes, um, and especially with mid speeds this dangerous. Yep. Okay. Yeah, like the this this is the iconic one. It's the it's reliable. You only have to play one copy for this to work. Uh, but if you you can have also have a guaranteed e extra reverse spin kick, which is a speed four. Sorry, speed six, six speed, six power ignore guard. The opponent discards three random cards. Yeah. Um, like it's a little less effective. Like, it's less efficient in into block, but uh, than just playing one copy because one copy beats block just as hard as two copies. You didn't need to exit, right? Uh, um, but uh, but it is a guaranteed guard crush. So right, getting you know, that getting that speed up there all the way to to six at range two to keep it on curve. Okay, mm. so yeah. and if so... your opponent is ever out of crosses, or actually, let me just pull out this other example here at range three, preempts a sonic boom. Beats right. everything. Beats everything. Sure, it's on curve now. It's uh, you can't you can't cross out of it either way. It, you that's can't what cross out of it. Literally, what it's for. In fact, okay. Um, you can't cross out of it. You can't assault into it. Should I be? No. I, I mean, I was about to say, should I be worried about this not being punishing enough because it's only four? And then I remember the crit effect. But um, uh, four damage rather and then I remember the crit yeah. effect. But am yeah. I looking for to sort of optimize my my damage output per payout by hitting with this or hitting with this? before i before i go with sonic boom or is it basically just like what my hand will give me that's fair um yeah let me actually point out that 
these two are the crits you usually don't pay for. Um, because if you're doing this, you're just saying, all right, I need to, I'm, I need to have two more damage on this trade. Right. Because in, in the situations where you prefer to play these, they're not trading. Right. Uh, and sure. that's really, really true of Flash Cake, where you go, oh, I beat a sweeper of focus, depending on what range or what situation we were in. You know, I, I didn't trade, I just won. Right. Am I going to pay one gauge for plus two power, or would I rather have one gauge for plus three cards because I'm Guile? Right, later on. Uh, or next turn, rather. Yeah. Next next turn. Right. You know. Whereas these uh, are are kind of I mean like in in yeah. the case of the uh, this one, these two. Yeah. In the in the case of um in the case of these, these are kind of card defining or interaction defining because they, they do kind of fundamentally change what's happening here. So you yeah, are, they change you are, interaction. You're more likely to pay for these. Well, I guess spin kick changes your interaction with your opponent afterward, like they might be It changes the value prospect. Like, right. Right. Th this is somewhere in the middle, but in practice it is a if you are striking and you decide to make your attack critical, your opponent has to think about it being this card sure. because you really prefer to play this critical. Right. Right, um, right. right. Because of how punishing it is. Like in theory it is like, oh yeah, you're just paying to win harder when you already won. But a lot of the value of this card is in that grid effect. Right. Sure. Uh, like, it is actually perfectly illegal to play a spinning back knuckle that is not critical if you really don't believe that your opponent has a sweep that they're ready to play. Right. Um, but typically, you're going to do it because this, you know, becomes un unbeatable. Uh, well, not unbeatable. It becomes, it breaks sweep right. and evades focus. So. Right. Okay. But but the, the value of reverse spin kick, other than being a, a range one to two, the semi spike, is that mm -hmm. resource denial? Yeah, like that. That that effect is is where at least where the offensive threat lies. Uh, you also can totally just play a copy that's non-critical on defense if you need to filter out a sweep. Sure, sure. Right. Sure. If you go, oh, my opponent has a speed two or lower card that I really don't want to get hit by. You can just kind of play this and go, well, I'm beating exactly that. Right. Yep. You're yep. you're playing your range one spike. Um, that's a situation where you're playing it as an answer card, which leans more into Guile as a defensive character, which we'll talk about very shortly now. Yep. Um, all right, but yeah, so that's kind of where where your value is. Actually, let's just look very briefly. If you look at the, his printed power values, adding his crits, right? Six, six, five, two, eight, seven, nine. Yep. Right. So it's five, six, six, seven, eight, nine, two. Yep. <laughs> uh, like one one standout, and then very high printed and then, power and then a across. Lot. Right. Yeah. And, and I'm and saying printed, the, sorry, very high effective power, very and, high effective power. And one of those fives is uh, is on reverse spin kick, which is you already talked up as being a particularly punishing card. So even the one that yeah. is not an outlier is really, really it hurts. It hurts bad. Yeah, yeah. Like the it's five six six seven eight or two five six six seven eight nine, and the five is maybe the most crushing one to get hit by. Right. Yeah. Five um. is five is like a lose a friend card. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Uh, it's it's. Yeah, it's horrifying. Right. Okay. Uh, so a lot of damage in this kit, right. just overall. Yep. Mr. Midspeed, lots of damage, and then you have preemptive so that you can confirm it really well. Um, all right. So let's talk about the rest of the boosts. Yes. Um, all right. So yes, light, fierce, defend, except not really. Yeah. Um, these all say at the end of your next turn, add this to gauge. Uh, and I wanted to point out for, for people who have played Guilty Gear Strive the board game, the very important difference between end of turn and start of turn. Yes. Um, if you boost defense, regular old fashioned defense. Yes. Uh, it's going to sit and play until the next strike, right? It, it's a continuous boost. This is how they work. Uh, which means that multiple turns can pass. Your opponent might play something. You might boost something else. You can have a boost for good old fashioned boost for it's a good time for everybody. Right. Um, if you boost faultless defense, your opponent makes a choice. They say either, well, assuming you don't cancel, that's another matter. But anyway, your opponent says either. Uh, they are striking and you have plus four guard, or they are not striking and you have plus one gauge. Yes. Right. So the opponent gets to choose, uh, but it's not going to be a card where on your turn you're initiating with plus four guard unless you're paying a gauge to cancel it. Right. Uh, cancel from it, rather. Um, home on defense is the best of both worlds. Um, if the opponent initiates, it's plus one arm, plus three guards. If they don't, you have the choice between whether you're initiating with plus one arm, plus three guard, or you're ending turn without striking, which means you'll get a gauge. Right. So the opponent can respond with it like they would to either of these. But if the turn comes back to you, then actually you're in control of what happens next. Right, right, right. 
And and so what you can't do, the difference between these two, you can't then put another boost on top of it and now you have two boosts because by the end of your turn you're losing it. But right. you're you're gaining gauge. So oh so the, yeah. oh, this is um your guile. You're down backing. You're you're turtling exactly. in the corner. Okay, I got you. These these four boosts are guile down backing. Yeah. Uh and they are and they are specifically all that kind of preparatory motion where you can't really do a boost war. It's not for long term setup. Right. It is for short term setup where you go, uh, actually, you're probably not comfortable striking into me because I'm, pr I'm ready for it. Right. Um, and if they do, you're, you're ready to win the strike because the thing you did set up for it. Right. Um, the most compelling of these tends to be military discipline. Sure. Because this, as I mentioned earlier, speed is a defensive stat. Yep. It says, even if you initiate, I'm going to outspeed you. And now you need to be nervous about me outspeeding you. Yep. Uh, so this tends to be a good way early game to say, hey, get off me. I have speed, which actually means that I want gauge. Right. And then if they initiate into you, hopefully you are actually ready to win that mix up. That's on you. Yep. Um, and, and you do and have then, the option when it when the turn passes back to you, if they don't take the bait. OK, I've got, you know, it, we, we just got done talking about a bunch of very, very punishing mid speeds that would really love uh, plus two speed on them. So you can you can make good on this threat. It doesn't have to go to gauge maybe later in the game. Mm -hmm. OK. Yeah. Yeah. And that. Yeah. So like if you have resources and and this will be especially true if you're playing frontside guile where like you're not under pressure under so under this guile uh no i should i should pause for a moment and explain this so the other line of guile that is not big hand guile uh generally doesn't use the exceed at all because you don't really need to uh but it still uses his ability which is you know as an action you pay a gauge and you draw three cards and you draw a card for an turn so it's one gauge for basically four cards right yeah. um it and it passes turn and you can pay more force to draw more cards if you're so inclined if you need to swap stuff out like any change cards action but it is a very very force efficient way to reload so it means you can do stuff like preemptive critical strike throw away you know three cards from hands and a gauge and then because you landed that hit because you made sure you were going to land that hit cool next turn you pay that gauge and now you're back to five six cards in hands right like, so so you go down and then you go back up yeah so so <laughs> big hand guile so named because of his huge hands. Um, th this is like never small hand guile. This is yeah. this is consistently medium to large hand guile, and then big and then big hand guile is eighteen cards. Is redefining the concept of how of how many cards you have in hand. Yeah, like okay. this. This is the guile who still has better economy than you because he reloads faster than you. Right. Where he's where where this is the, you know, I'm never actually out unless I'm completely out of gauge. Uh, and also have no hands. Right. Okay. Uh, and so the these so yeah so with that general pattern in mind, that means that uh, it's not that weird for this version of Guile who is not exceeding, who is not spending gauge every turn. He's only spending it when he needs to reload to accumulate more gauge over time. Right. Which means it's easier for him to play ultras, and it's easier for him to play crits when he needs to without without needing to rely on shades. Right. Uh, so that means it's not uncommon for him to have a okay, let me throw a big payout turn, but I still have a gauge left over so that if by some miracle I miss, or, you know, if I actually threw a mix-up and it was called out, I still reload next turn. Right. I'm not actually going to be down that much resources, that many turns, etc., because I can reload very, very efficiently. Right, okay. Um, and so that, so yeah, so yeah, so he loves having, uh, sorry, so the, so the gauge he gets off these is still high value for him, uh, and he can afford to spend the turn to play them, which this version generally can't. Right. Um, yes. Uh, go ahead. This is something that I asked <laughs> you about Rushdown Akuma when we discussed him a while ago, about the the utility of switching between different lines of play mid-game. Um, and what you said at the time was, like, when Akuma does it, he has a tendency to sort of use his resources in one way that will later deprive him of them. Is there any way mm -hmm. for Big Hand Guile to reactively become Big Hand Guile? Can he say, you know what? The the defensive kind of patient play is not working in this matchup. It is time to enlarge my hands. Or is he it like yeah. is there a similar yeah, no, problem? It's actually not that hard for him to do that. Um because the the most important tools for big hand guile to maintain for, for in order to prevent himself from getting locked out of interacting in the late game are roll and sonic boom and to a lesser extent flash kick. Okay. Uh, roll is the biggest one. Uh, because this is your my opponent tried to zone me actually no, and then Sonic right. Boom is your is your somewhat less 
awesome, but still pretty good. My opponent tried to zone me, but actually no. Right, okay. Um, and that's that's the thing you're weak to, because apart from Sonic Boom, none of your stuff is relevant. Um, uh, okay, apart from Sonic Boom and Sonic Hurricane, none of your stuff is relevant at range 4 greater. Right, okay. Um, so you go, okay, I need to make sure I have this so that if they run away, and I have 12 cards in hand, I don't have to take a walk action and then discard three cards. Right. Right. You're not going to waste time doing that. You're going to roll, maybe roll twice, and then strike, and then life moves on. Um, like, and then if they manage to go to the other end of the arena, because you're fighting in, literally the Enchantress, okay, right. well, now you also have Sonic Boom, and so you, right. now you do Sonic Boom a couple times, and then life moves on. Okay, so as, um, as long as, when I'm playing uh, medium to large hand Guile, as long as I'm keeping these active as threats coming into the late game, I can still flip if I need to. And Flashback right. you mentioned and, as well. Right, and I'll say that happen that tends to happen naturally because of how strong spinning back knuckle is as a payout. You're generally going to wait until your opponent has answers down. Maybe they're out of crosses, maybe they're out of assaults, or at least you have enough gauge and enough force and this in hand, and you're comfortable throwing it as preemptive. Which means that it's probably going to be mid game, maybe even late game, before you're ready to throw this, even if you're running a defensive guy line. Okay. Uh, so if you just go, oh, actually, let me just like I, I happen to have five gauge. Let me just go ahead and exceed. Still have all these threats online except for botch explosion, uh, and then start doing big hand shenanigans. Like, you, you can still do that. Okay. And then if they run away, then you go, oh, well, I guess I didn't get to do this payout. I'm just going to run after you and then proceed. And then do other things instead uh, yep. with, with roll. So, um, and the other, the other component of the, uh, the big hand guile line that might be slightly sensitive would be flash explosion because of shades, because big hand guile really kind of feels like he needs those. Uh, does front side guile see as much use out of shades and should i be trying to save it in case i do want to flip later in the game um uh, not really i mean so so i'll say it's less essential to him and part of the reason for that is that he's probably going to be boosting a lot more uh so like if you're if you're exceeded guile and you have and you're doing big hand line which means that you are above hand size and you are pressured to strike every turn because otherwise you'll have to discard a bunch of cards right you go okay i have to strike every turn one way or another your opponent plays a boost. They play light or whatever, and you go, oh, well, I guess I'm dealing with it by just striking with a mix-up, you know, just eating it, and, like letting them have the light, or I'm playing preemptive to negate it, and then striking, because I need to strike. Right. I don't have the option of not striking. Right. Um, this, this other version of Guile over here uh, doesn't have that problem. The opponent plays light, and he goes, sure, I'll play my light. If you want to have a boost war, then I can match you with a normal boost, and then beat you with a special boost if, right. you, if you keep it up for more than once turn. Right. Um, and if you decide that you want to like try to win a real boost war, then I'm going to end it with preemptive, preemptive and you'll sure. lose the strike. Right. Um, and so you don't have the kind of like, oh, like dealing dealing with these situations is awkward. Uh, so that means notably that engaging in boost wars with your opponent pressures their attacks. Uh, sorry, I may have I may have led into that without explaining why it's important. Um, if you're boosting with your if you're boosting normals, if you're boosting these, your opponent's going to be like, man, him having plus two speed all the time is kind of kind of kind of nerve wracking. But if I ever attack these, I can't take shades. I can't take shades, and now okay, and and I have uh, uh, I have a use for shades that my opponents are not going to want. Right, so it's like you put shades on, and it's like, well, maybe it's a little less frightening on this than it is on this, but you still have the ability to exceed once you right. get to gauge. So shades is still an omnipresent threat, but you're also making it a little harder to deal with it in the meantime. Okay. The, uh, yeah. No, that makes sense. And even front side guile is not getting a huge amount out of flash explosion, maybe more so than than big hand guile because he's he's going to have more gauge and it's a strong attack, but yeah. He She's He's going to have more gauge. Powerful. Well, it's it's actually less that change is that much more powerful, and it's that it's my fifth mid speed. Like, yeah, you've got oh. you've got redundancy. Yeah, it's like, oh man, if only I had a thing that did what this does at range two. Oh wait, oh wait, oh wait, oh wait. Right, um, right, right. Like, hmm, I, I, you know, I guess I can pay four gauge for this if I if I'm convinced that I need it. And if you do, and you're right, you probably win the game. Right. Um, because you had two armor and nine power, um, and yeah, oops, you're dead. But uh, but yeah, like it's 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 more you don't need it because you have so many other things to handle things. You have so many other mid speeds. Um, 
So I, I find he does not ever really rely on Flash Explosion in the way that he tends to rely on Preemptive of Sonic Hurricane. Uh, either side, by the way, like Preemptive is great. Sonic Hurricane is also a very, very good attack. This is a power. Yes. Uh, a power with this after effect, which is fantastic. Yeah. Um, just set set position you want. And it seems like from everything you're talking about, unless you're trying to dodge a specific attack, the position that you're setting is two. So that you can certainly. keep, yeah, you can keep on playing the, the entire rest of your kit, including many of your normals. Yes. Yeah. The, the reason that you don't go to range two with this is because you have some other checkmate that needs to be not range two. Right. It's like, oh, I have the other Sonic Hurricane and also EX Spike. Let me go to range three and play, you know, Critty X Spike. Or not right. Crit, sorry, Prime to be EX Spike. Uh, although actually, I don't know why that wouldn't work at two anyway. It's still speed six. Well, whatever. It's still a lot. Yeah. If, if they've got yeah. if they've got EX Cross that they've somehow been holding against all of your other mid speeds, like whatever whatever math needs to happen in order to make that work, you could do it if you needed to. Yeah. If they have some reason that they are scary at two, if they have a DP, right? Sure, sure. They have a speed seven range two option. They're like, oh, I don't want to deal with sure you can. So I'm not going to go to range two to play my speed six spike. I'm going to go to range three and play it where sure you can loses. There you go. That's yeah. That's a sort of situation where that can matter. So when I'm um, when I'm uh doing matchup prep as guile i'm looking for above curve options at range two in particular very very strongly because they are they're turning off way more of my cards yes okay. uh, and by the way let me now talk about what the role these boosts play that is the main value of this boost is is to make it so that your opponent can't just shut things down by being That's silly true. and above curve Right. Where you go, okay, now your DP doesn't beat spinning back knuckle, doesn't beat sweep kick or double sweep kick. Well, it might double. It depends on. It, it depends, actually, with this one. Right. Uh, because positioning is a little weird in this one. This does not hit at range one, notably. Right, right. This is a range two to three card. So that's like a little bit weird. Um, and then your other reverse spin kick is also safe against most DPs where they're four power attacks. Right. So that's, in my experience at least, that's the main value of Homeland Defense because generally playing this boost is like. The lowest value of of the three, well, the four. Sorry, excuse me. Um, but it it does mean that if your opponent was really looking to answer your mid speed with the fast, then it, it they can't anymore. Yes. Um, okay. And so that can buy you a turn in order to build a gauge to do something stupid because that's what you like to do. Yes. Got it. Okay. Um, and I feel like the the plus two power boost is fairly self explanatory. You're you're either hitting a, a magical breakpoint or you're making your your threat scarier. We've talked um, a lot about plus two speed. I'm sorry, go ahead. This this is actually probably better than it looks. Okay. Um because it's Sway the Warrior. Yeah, with with a now strike on it. Yeah. Like the, the plus two power if your opponent leaves it lying around. So so the one thing one of the things about power is that you're Mr. Midspeed. The only above curve carbon you have is this one over here, and it's only two prints of power. So that's never going to stop anything, right? Yeah, that's not. It's not very good at hitting breakpoints. Um, mm. So, like, you, you throw plus two power out, your opponent strikes. There's a good chance they're diffusing it. There's a good chance they have some way that to say, no, I'm actually not participating in the strike. Right. Um, if they leave it in play, though, you can turn it into I'm I'm just winning the strike extremely hard. Actually, you're you're dead. Right. Okay. Um, and so it is a very potent first boost. That your opponent is often going to try to defuse because if this, if this, you're always threatening this to be your second boost, right? Um, and if you say plus two power and they say plus two speed, now your power doesn't matter. You go actually our speed's even, and I'm initiating. Like you, you know, it's it's this is speed confirms power, right? Power is the threat that speed confirms. Definitely, um, yeah. Uh, and then yes, you are what speed speed is speed. You you can throw it out and go okay. Now you don't want to initiate into me because I can beat you even if you initiate. Um, and my mid speeds are really scary. You're usually not going to do this into preemptive, but I've done strike. it. Right? Yeah. Like this is this is a situational thing where you go, yeah, I actually need a speed seven spike. Right. Um, I need to I need to beat a nine speed option or something like that, or or yeah, or it's really, like really situationally. Bump up a, sure. Yeah. Where you go? Okay. I I really do actually need plus four speed this turn right now. Um. So obviously the situations can happen. They're not common. Right. Um, usually in the early game, you throw this out and you go, OK, I have speed. If they don't strike into me, I do something else and I have gauge. Um, right. You can also initiate with it, but most of your stuff, even with plus two speed, is going to be a mix up. Mm -hmm. um, like the, the way the, the big exception is this one, and that's expensive. Doing this early game is hard because you go, OK, I could have had plus one gauge and a turn to do something else. Instead, I am spending a gauge. Um, and and not not getting that back. So like you'll you'll probably win the strike. It's pretty good, but 
whether you could leverage that gauge for more value is yeah it's something that you need to think about i think usually you can like right. usually this is going to be a late game payout um and this is going to be a please hold i want gauge um, right and, and if, if it happens to be around in the in the late game in your front side guile you still can use it to confirm all of this stuff it's still going to be there yeah okay yeah um and there's there's some incredibly scary stuff you can do along those lines where you go oh what if i had plus two or plus four speed flash explosion what if I threw out this boost and then threw out this, and then I sit on Way of the Warrior for a turn, right. and they have to decide what they're going to do about it on the next turn? Like, um, because these are very potent second boosts as well. Like, they they essentially give you command over over neutral on that middle turn, right? Um, because because usually, you always do have the option to to cash them out and not have them go to gauge later in the game, right? Okay. And you can make that decision after seeing what the opponent does if the opponent doesn't strike. If the opponent does strike, you know, then cool, they're striking into you when you have two boosts in play. That's pretty good. Right. Um, like you're in pretty good shape there. Um, I should also make mention of this one. This is range bonus. It is like the least remarkable of these, but is but is still relevant. Right. So range is a bit like effective speed, right? Sure. So because of how the speed curve works, because of how exceed works, plus one maximum range is often like plus one speed, except that it means that things hit at ranges where they didn't. Um, which sounds obvious, but it's really, really important because this mm -hmm. means that flash kick beats grasp at range one. And it means that you have a range four, a, a suite of range four options, which are wonderful, which are called sweep, spike, assault. Yep. Um, like you play the range three mix up of exceed at range four. And in particular, sweep doesn't lose to anything except for, you know, projectiles that push and cross because you can hit with sweep at range four and it beats dive and it beats sweep and it beats focus and it beats block and it beats assault. And, it, you know, like it, it's, it's fantastic. So right. Sonic Force usually is going to be your, which is notable also because range four is the range at which range on double speed kick makes it kind of stupid because it becomes a speed six range four option. Um, but yes, yeah, so Sonic Force is commonly played at range one so that you can catch grasp with flash kick or uh, cross with sweep, or you're going to play it at range four so that you turn on the entire range three mix up for yourself but not for your opponents. Uh, and commonly, doing it at range four is great because it makes the opponent want to come into range one, which is way better for you overall than range four. In range four, sure. Uh, and you go, okay, cool. They saved me, you know, three force or a, you know, a run or whatever. Right. Uh, I mean, at the very least, range one is closer to range two than range four is. If you need to back up exactly. to, to two, that's easier. Yeah. I mean, you do like, ar arguably, it's easier to go from four to two because you have roll, but that costs you a roll, right? That's like, true. you're, you're right. expecting to spend multiple movement resources per game against most people because most people are not going to let you sit at range two and beguile because uh, right. that, that's how they die. Um, right. Like, that's not good for them. They won't make the, the same mistake twice. Right. Um, yeah. Uh, one, one other thing I should mention, despite how good range 2 is, despite how much he wants to come in, despite how much he hates being zones, uh, you are allowed to play cross as an attack. The reason you're allowed to play cross as an attack is because you have Sonic Boom and Sonic Hurricane. Right. Um, so if you don't have one of those in your hands, then no, you're not allowed to play cross as an attack. Don't do it. Right, right, um, right. But the, these are your doctor's note that says, actually, I am allowed to play cross as an attack. Yeah, just this once um, as, a, as a treat. Because you've been so good. Yes. Yes. Um, and and uh, if, after if that, you've been, go, go ahead. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Go ahead. Say, if if you've if you've been a little good, you can play this one. If you've been three gauge good, you can play this one. Right. Yeah. Oh. You get to the special trip. And obviously, after that, uh, you need a plan to move back in. But this is part of the plan because the after this on is part them, of your plan. Yeah. The after yes. on them is going to get you back into striking range again. Yes. You cross out. Just kidding. I'm back at range three or range two, uh, right. depending on which one you play. So like you you. Unlike a lot of characters who really love melee range, which you do, you are perfectly willing to play cross because you do have the tools to come back in pretty efficiently and you have them pretty reliably. Right. And you're very good at doing that. Okay. You are making it largely face up when you do that. Yeah. Like if I if I come You're doing out, that? Yeah. It's yeah. it's because you don't have dive to stop this. Or I and yep. or I don't have the four the three gauge needed to threaten the dive. Like yeah. this or is they don't, and, and it's and it's mostly like the opponent should be cornered as well, because otherwise they can cross out of Sonic Hurricane. Sonic Hurricane, sure. And that's awful. And even if I have uh, one copy, if I've crossed out of midboard, and then I hit them with Sonic Hurricane, and they cross out of Sonic Hurricane, well, I don't want to be at range eight, because even yeah. with the move after from Sonic or Sonic Boom, I'm sorry, uh, that's still a lot mm. more spaces I've got to I've got to push in. Yeah, it's like they you 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 go from two to five. And then they retreat to eight, and you close back to six, and you're like, actually, this wasn't good for me. Right. Like, 
I, I did get some damage in. It was quote unquote free, but if my opponent has ranged options, I'm I just spent a bunch of them. Yeah. So like so like you can do it, but the thing is that you are going to be creating for yourself the situ the bad situation that these need to answer for you, which means that you need to be sure that you're not going to need them because your opponent is going to create that situation. So it's like right. okay, if the opponent's going to put you at range, use them to deal with your opponent putting you at range. Uh, if you have these tools and your opponent is not putting you at range, then you can put yourself at range for a turn or two, like I said, as a treat. Okay. okay. Um, but yeah, you have that. You have that ability. It's legal. You know, there are characters where it is not legal. This is not one of them. Yep. Um, okay, that all makes sense. Absolutely. Yeah. Cool. Any any questions from here? I'm, I'm trying to think if there's anything I I missed or I haven't talked about. But I feel like I've covered. Yeah, I feel the like of it. I feel like that's that's a, a ton of information. Um, I'm looking at our time. We are uh, we are an hour and five, which is uh, hey, which is brisk. unusual. Yeah, we did we're doing great. <laughs> so so a couple of things. Uh, we we talked quite a bit about the the kind of economic side of it. Um, any particularly notable interactions in terms of of bluffing a crit or um or or playing with your gauge with a crit uh, for for a mix up or are his crits he has so many crits that they're kind of all, they're all threatening everything. So I, I yeah, assume it'd be it'd be a normal that you would be bluffing for. Yeah, let me grab your other range two crits. Um, there you go. Right. Uh, and this this is notable because your opponent looks at these two cards and says, "Well, I guess my only choice is to block, especially if you have a preemptive up." Sure. Uh, and then a preemptive spike beats, you know, block like really, really, really hard. Really hard. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, so like a critical spike is going to kill the things that would otherwise deal with these. Um, if the opponent has cross and wants to use it, then a critical sonic boom, at, even at range two, this is a ballsy read, but yep. some, sometimes they need to know that you can do it. Yep. Um, I usually will not crit double sweep kick, even though on paper it should do the exact same thing, where you go, yeah, they want, I'm critting, they, I don't have speed in play, I'm critting at range two. They want to play cross. They really want to play cross. Um, because I would rather do this with like shades or some other like the, to me the reward of doing this even with the even with the thing uh is a little too low because if they don't play a cross, they probably play a block. And this into block is kind of fine, but it puts me at range one. Which is a like not bad, but yeah, I don't love it. Um, right. So right. I don't I don't generally crit on this, even though on paper it should do the same thing. If I want to call out the cross really hard, I'm going to play Sonic Boom at range two. Sure. Um, because, like I said, it, it's a madman play, but sometimes you have to be a madman if you're going to run mix ups, and if you're a Street Fighter character, you're probably going to run mix ups. Definitely. Um, Guy was no exception. Um, okay. But yes, I will I will absolutely crit spike. I will absolutely preemptive crit spike. Um, I have crit assault a little less commonly. Uh, crit ex assaults I've done. Um, that that two, also range two. yeah at range two because that also looks like these right. Um, and if there's no speed in play, both of these crit ex lose to cross. Yep. And and ex assault catches it. Yeah. Okay. That makes sense. So if it um, seems like I think an awful lot about cross, I do. Yeah, I can't imagine yeah. why. The uh, it, that it, yeah. it's a bunch of your mid speeds. <laughs> a, a, a dominant range two card against a range two character who who tends to be kind of slow and mid speedy is an, an important thing to think about. Yep. So, so in terms of, uh, and this is something I ask you probably every every time I sit down with you, uh, talking about counterplay. It sounds like the guile play writ extremely large and extremely broadly is stay at range two, deal with their range two options, kill them at range two, uh, hand size notwithstanding. Uh, yeah, I know. The, the counterplay to this you've sort of been alluding to. It's it's play the range game better than him it's um uh deny him his ability to play these really damaging cards uh any other things that that my opponents are going to be trying to do specifically against guile that i as the guile player should be on the lookout for and be able to defuse um so yeah so i've talked about zoning him that's a big one right force him to spin these the, the more roles he plays the fewer spinning back knuckles he plays right um that's enormous yeah right um if he runs big hands, his greatest weakness is reading. Reading, sure. The, the boost called re like the effect called reading. Uh, if you are playing a guilty Shred the board game character, please look into scramble instead, where the thinner his deck is, the less control he has over it, and you can play a thing that beats 
almost all single cards he could play because what Guile wants to play is an EX from hands if he has right. a million cards in hands. Right. Right. It's not him that opportunity. If you're not playing a Strive character, then play Reading because he probably has it. You know, he's holding 18 cards in hand. He's got five cards in deck. Okay. He's probably has at least one of whatever normal you're inclined to name. Right. A um, little bit of an extreme example, but that, that's, you know, numerically extreme. That's that's the same idea there. Like, sure. If you're playing against this guy, uh, initiate into him. Uh, play the mix up without fear. Right. So he, he puts this into play at range one and you go, okay. He, he has a decently strong set of options here where he can play a sweep or a grasp or some incredibly stupid mid speed. Then I should initiate with a grasp or a cross or a dive. Yes, a dive at range one. That beats mm -hmm. like that if he responds with any mid speed, he will, you know, dive wins. Yep. Uh, and also he's down that mid speed. Yep. Right. Uh, and your dive is usually going to be reserved for either teching this nonsense or doing that job because you're not really going to be at range three a lot. If you're at range three, he's probably playing a solve for double speed kick. So right. like your dive is not a very good defensive tool. Right. And it's um, pretty rare that you're going to be at extreme range from Guile and you want to move in on him. Mm -hmm. Yes. Right. Like you let him spend the resources to move in. The, the, the caveat is. That if you are like significantly down on life, if you're down on resources, the way he moves in might be a sonic boom and you're just going to eat it. And that can be a bit of a problem. Like you don't really want to leave yourself a sitting duck for sonic boom either. Um, but it's, it's generally less bad to make him spin them. Uh, and also like if he telegraphs it, then maybe you can parry it. Assuming that you're a character with parry again, you know, season caveats. Yep. If you're a season six character, your tech hits uh, is your tech is not on dive. It's on block. That's a little annoying. I will say, though, don't feel too bad if you can't block his payouts. Blocking his payouts is often a trap, because if you get used to blocking his payouts, he's going to throw either Spike or Assaults, both of which are going to either ignore your armor or gain advantage, and then he still has the mid-speed that you were afraid of. Yes, and you don't um, have you don't have uh, a tech hit. You don't have a, I'm sorry, you don't have a block. You don't have any other way to... to yeah, um, you don't have block, and you don't have tech hit, so now he can throw out Shades, and you go, oh, well, now I have to stun him honestly, sure, and then that, he will say, actually, you're never stunning me. Right. Right, and a, pro a proper guy will play is you must deal with this with tech because I will never be stunned voluntarily. Right, that's actually uh, something that we should we should probably talk a little bit more about now that I think of it because um, looking at this boost more closely, two guard is actually on its own. That's why you mentioned putting two of these down. It doesn't. It doesn't guard. change. Yeah, one one two two guard changes no interactions among normals. Right, um, and and even like. Like you like this card does two damage. There's not Among a lot single. of cards oh. that do that do two damage. Um so mm -hmm. you're you're looking for at least three guard, preferably four, to make it safe against most most fast things. So this yeah. is this is good on things that already have guard, not necessarily things that are um uh, yeah, it's not it's not yeah, it's not like this where you where you go, Oh, I can put defend on assault and now assault is safe. Right. Um like it doesn't actually work that way, especially because if you even if you're doing that, like even if you have two copies of shades, assault is still not safe because if you want to play sweep, you lose two copies of shades. Right. Uh, that's not the thing that you've signed up for. That's not good. So you're you're generally going to go, okay, um, I need to have focus, block, sweep, flash kick. Yep. Um and note this though, if you have shades and or two shades, you know, one or two copies of shades, and you know you need to keep them. You don't you, you don't have the time to throw out another, or you don't have the other one, uh, and you are very worried about being being stunned. Cool. You can also play Spike, even at range one, and Sonic Boom, even at range one. Because okay. four guard, five guard, turns into six guard or seven guard. Hard to beat. Which says, I'm not stunned, right? right. You go, I'm going to make sure that I'm not getting stunned out of my shades. I'm going to keep my shades on at all costs. Yep. Um, then this this is an all costs situation where you're going. I'm playing Sonic Boom at range one when I think they're playing sweep. Right. Like that's bad. That's very bad. But you want those shades yeah. on. But you want those shades. Okay. And um um you already mentioned the utility of an ex attack on something with no guard when you have two copies in particular of shades down to get up to that six threshold. Yes. Uh, yeah, that turns six anything. effective. Yeah, that makes everything yeah. fairly safe. That makes everything. Yeah, with with two copies of shades, you have plus four guard. With an ex, you have plus one armor, plus five guard, which means you can play anything you want. Ex okay. grasp doesn't get stunned by sweep. Right. You know, you you just like play any ex you want, and you don't have to worry about losing your shades. Right. Obviously, there are exceptions. Obviously, there are caveats. But by default, you go okay. I'm unstunnable. Right. Let's go. And a and a one one shade plus ex on something with no guard. Hit, hits far effective, which, as we discussed, is 
fairly not safe, actually as reliable, but not not, like it's, it's, not as safe as it needs to be in order to maintain those shades. Yes, it will work just fine on your mid speeds. Yes, because it will that, work fine on reverse bend kick. That's going to break the things that's going to that's going to stun it reactively. Exactly, like the Got things it. that these are worried about are sweep and focus, and focus is focus is the thing that resists this, and focus is four power. Mm -hmm. So ex spinning back knuckle plus shades, or two shades plus one spinning back knuckle. Four total defenses, you know, either one arm or three guard or four guard. Focus doesn't stun it. And then if they play sweep, they're stunned. Right. And then reverse spin kick is just they're stunned, right? Yeah. If they play focus or sweep. So, like, these, these are the ones where you can go, okay, if I have either an EX and shades or two, two shades, I can play them, it'll be fine. Right. Like, I'm not going to get stunned by anything that matters. Uh, it is a little dicey to, to EX spinning back knuckle as amazing as it is as a stat line it costs you two copies of roll of roll, and, uh, exactly uh, yeah yeah kinda, you're you're, de you're, de you're depriving yourself of your answer to a big part of guile's counterplay yep got it that is correct okay oh that all makes sense um i don't think i have any other any other questions is there anything else that you want to oh actually uh this is maybe the most important question of all do you need your own like irl copies of shade copies of shades to play guile yes okay. yes i i have at my desk two pairs of sunglasses that i got at a convenience store so that i can play guile you online. can play guile legally yes yes okay. if, you, if you don't have physical sunglasses with you you must acquire some as soon as possible okay um, and, and tts I is will... not an excuse you should be playing no, no. with the glasses at your computer okay 100 percent. i've got them at my computer for me uh with me for that reason uh, i will warn you though that is that is one of guile's major weaknesses with two pairs of shades on it becomes a lot harder to read cards that's true I yeah. can I can attest this from ample experience. Yeah, no, that's that's extremely uh, dangerous. Yeah, it's really easy to mix up what you're actually looking at, uh, but it's worth it. Yep. So, well, and I mean the intimidation factor alone, right? Of of having Absolutely. two, yeah, staring down your opponent or where you assume your opponent is, it's kind of hazy. Uh, with yeah. two cop with two shades on is difficult to match for sure. Yeah. All right, um, D. As always, thank you so much. Uh, this has been a great uh, lesson. I'm excited to play some Guile and, and see if I can make any of these lines work. Um, uh, I'm I'm looking forward to the next time we get to talk about a character. Um, oh, sorry, one more. Actually, for real, one more question. Any not uh -huh. about shades? Any other characters like Guile that that people who are a fan of Guile should be looking for, or if they're already a fan of another character, maybe you should try out Guile. That's fair. Um, yeah, it depends on what part you're a fan of, uh, because if you if you enjoy the turtling aspect of the gameplay, with and to park behind a boost and then have a decision, well, the, I force a difficult decision on the opponent, and then after they made that decision, maybe I have a cool decision where it's like, if you don't initiate into me, I'm going to decide what cool thing I'm going to do with my newfound boost. Um, but you're not actually sitting there building up literally forever. You're not running an, an indefinite uh, boost for where you're trying to win individual strikes super hard, you're just doing consistent value, um, kind of medium-term game plans a lot, um, then that's that leads into a lot of boost characters, a lot of characters who are um, what we uh, have have adopted as a malapropism uh, set play, uh, or aggressive set play in Exceed, um, which fighting game players are throwing rocks at. Because, uh, that, that's putting it a little too harshly. Anyway, set play means something in fighting games that doesn't really make sense to put in a card game. Right. Um, and so we co-opted the term to refer to uh, setup patterns, which are about kind of looping advantage states, which is related that's to a, set play. In that's about games. as close as you can get in an exceed context to what set play means in a fighting game. Yeah. Yeah. Like it did. Yeah. But, you know, I understand it. It's not exactly the same. Anyway. Uh, so, yeah. Uh, boost characters who like to build up advantages. Um, I am notoriously bad at most boost characters. The characters mm -hmm. that I play that play boost tend to be the characters who don't play like most boost characters. Um, I play the hyper aggressive Guile lines. I don't really play defensive Guile very much at all. Uh, I play Viper, who plays boost but is not a boost character because sure. she never sits behind one. Her boost is in play and she's striking. Right. Uh, I play Kokonoe, who is also not at all a defensive character. Uh, and then I'm really bad at the ones who are more defensive. I'm not a good Chun Li. I'm not a good Renea. I am not a good Platinum, who isn't actually all that defensive, but I'm still bad at her. Anyway, uh, so. So wait, yeah. So I guess my I guess I have to re recommend the characters that I'm like bad at, right? So let me think. So so characters like that um, would be like Mika from season six. Um, I already mentioned Platinum from season five. Um, Takuman loves his boost as well mm -hmm. uh, from season five. King Knight from season four. Okay. Um, Chun Li uh, from season three. Renea and uh, 
Eh. We'll go. We'll just go with Renee from season two. I'm not super confident in the others. Um, I guess Shovel Knight. Um, right. As like here, here are some characters who are totally boost characters. Um. Uh, oh, Wagner, right. Season six, Wagner is also another one. Uh, and then in, in in season seven, we go to like Jacko, Anji. Um, the boost dynamic, like the boost war dynamic, is pretty different in season seven because of how cancels work. Sure. Um, but depending on how you play them, um, those are the the first two that come to mind. I feel like there should be a more obvious. Oh yeah, Faust, um, boost character. Um, if the part of Guile that you are intrigued by is, what if I drew cards and struck literally every turn, and I just never had to put my, you know, lift my foot off the gas even for a split second? Um, it's fine if it requires some work to get started, because Guile is not a breakneck rushdown. He's not Viper. He does not get to start as a rushdown character. Um, but once you get started, you never stop. If that's what you're interested in, where you go, yeah, I'll put some work into doing setup, and then I will never, ever stop rolling. Um, then... Yeah, let's 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 think rushdowns. Uh, so, obviously, I've already praised the Viper as a rushdown character. Uh, Ken mm -hmm. is also notable all rounder rushdown, who's a bit more flexible with his ranges. Um, uh, if hand size is your thing, let's talk about Jin Kisaragi from uh, Blaze Blue. From Blaze Blue. Talk about Enchantress. Yep, Enchantress from Shovel Knight. Yep. Um, who has kind of a jankier economy, but also has the property of if you don't want to have an empty hand, you don't have to ever. Yep, ever. Um, just yeah, not a thing. Uh, Linne, uh in in Undernight has a very like I'm going to do a bunch of things in my early game that set it for an endless advantage chain in my late game. Um, and while Guile is not as advantage chainy, it is it is in my opinion the same kind of yeah. Once you're rolling, you're never stopping. Like the the game will be over by the time you're done paying out all the stuff that you set up. Right. Um. And then uh yeah so and then Nagaruki stands out as he he's actually a turn one like he, he he doesn't need to start setting up he actually needs to kill you before his gas runs out because he right. starts the full tank right um yeah nagaruki as notably aggressive character um uh leo also very very aggressive with uh a bit sillier in his setup requirements he's a wild swinger that works a bit differently mm -hmm. uh and then may uh of the jellyfish pirates as yeah here's rushdown your attacks are self-supporting and you get to keep attacking basically constantly that's pretty good uh, let me see. Are there seasons I haven't named characters from? I want to make sure that people have options. Uh, you you didn't mention anybody from Red Horizon. Um, yeah, let and, me go back to Red and for, Horizon. And, and for, the, for the for the for the rushdown line for Seventh Cross as well, because you mentioned Renea for for Standard Guile as a comparison point. Stuff. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Galdred has some interesting properties, but I think most people would have a hard time playing him as your rushdown, even though I tend to like playing him that way. So I'll instead go with like Pookie and Slinka. Uh, Pookie in particular is actually specifically a mid late game monster who has a really weird early game and then he has a bunch of stuff that turns on specifically various by various different explicit thresholds where he needs to have a gauge and a transformation and be in exceed mode and a 15 less for life and have three or less cards in hands right um like those are actual explicit things that need that need to be the case and once once he qualifies for each of them he turns on some ridiculous action compression where he can do a bunch of things and is very very aggressive but he is also a boost character who can kind of park behind little little stat boosts in the early game a lot so pookie is a decent example um and then Selinka, I, I typically have found Selinka to be extremely aggressive. Um, I've seen variant lines, so your mind may vary. But, um, and she has absurd amounts of power in the late game. What she does not have, though, is the I have defensive boost play. Like, doesn't really exist. Right. Um, very good late game rushdown. Not, not so much the early game portion of things. Uh, season one, let's see. Who am I worst at? Oh, so Heidi, the boost character. There we go. <laughs> who am I worst at? Um, I'm just thinking of like, how do I figure out who the boost characters are? Who well, right. who are the ones I'm really bad at? All right, right. Heidi, there you go. Um, yeah, uh, I'm also terrible at Niska for a different reason. That that I'm, Niska is not like Guile, uh, as far as I know, anyway. Um, if so, that would explain why I haven't figured it out because I never noticed. <laughs> anyway, but yes, Heidi's boost character. Um, uh, let's see. Thinking through these, uh, I mean, you've got various options for whom you can play as Rushdown. Um, that's like Reese is the most obvious one. Ulrich has some rushdown in him. Uh, Satoshi, let's not talk about yep. Satoshi. Anyway. Nope, moving on. Um, there's some weirdness there. And I guess I, to be perfectly honest, I have to also say Juno. Juno, um, sure. She's not balanced for a regular play, but boy, has she got some awesome rushdown stuff in her. Um, and that's that's pretty darn fun. Um, yeah, uh, Devers might also be a boost character. I'm pretty bad with him. Okay. Um, 
don't know. Uh, he's he's kind of more of a resource monster. Oh, wait a minute. Yeah, okay, maybe Everest. Maybe it Everest. I'm like resource monster with boosts. Yeah, wait a minute. Hey, oh, yeah. That sounds, that sounds kind of <laughs> Wait a minute. Can we uh, picture <laughs> Devris with really flat hair and sunglasses and we're like, hang on a second? Mm, it starts to make sense. It's, I think we've never uh, seen Guile and Devris in the same place at the same time. Uh, I, I, I actually have. Oh, you have? Okay. But, All right. Yeah, so maybe sorry. not. Maybe yeah. he's not Guile. Yeah. One of my friends mains Devris. So, okay. Yeah. Uh, uh, but yeah. Uh, yeah. I will also note that um, just because I think it's cool, uh, a thing I like about Guile is how he kind of represents what in fighting games is called a, a mixed grappler or a half grappler archetype, which is he has grappler mix-ups, where if you're in his reach, he's throwing some big dumb mix-up at you, and it's scary, and he has big dumb payouts. Also, if you escape his reach, he will throw projectiles at you. Right. And you're sitting there going, wait a minute, I thought I was out of his range, right. but no, no. Sonic Boom. Nowhere. Sonic Boom will find you. Nowhere is safe. Yeah, you cannot hide from his from his ranged attacks, and they are decently hard hitting. Right, he's got six power Sonic Boom, eight power Sonic Hurricane. You go, well, what am I supposed to do then? So, in that note, a character who hits all of those notes but otherwise plays completely differently is Eugenia. Okay, um, but Eugenia is a I'm a grappler in melee and a zoner at range. I have range buttons and I have melee buttons, and you'll be sad either way. Right. Um, so if you if you like exactly that set of dynamics, then think about Eugenia from season two. Got it. All right, that's a, a, a so anybody who's a fan of any of those characters and hasn't managed to try Guile yet, give Guile a try. If you are a dedicated Guile main and you're looking for options, there's a whole bunch of them. Um, yep. Oh, I, I remembered one other character I'm bad at. Oh, who's that? Uh, Batista. Okay. Yeah, and I think she actually has uh, some similarities to Guile in in. But man, I'm really bad at Batista. I uh, I'm gonna leave that there, and hopefully, whenever you get a Batista video, that'll that'll sort out whether or not she's actually anything like that. Absolutely, Guile. you know, that'll be the first uh, question I'll ask: is is it, uh, can you make any comparisons between Batista and Guile? I'm asking for a friend. <laughs> there we go. Look, yeah. I look forward to it. Yeah, absolutely, and I will let you know how that goes. Um, all I'll right. So this time for real, uh, you know, twenty minutes Great after I, 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 twenty minutes after I uh, I mentioned it the first time. D, thank you so much for for being here and for walking me through Guile. I really appreciate it as always. Um, Happy to. I'm glad we're running late, true to form, instead of ahead of schedule. I'd be really disappointed. Yeah, no. I mean, that would honestly that would only set uh, unrealistic expectations for the future. There we go. Yeah. <laughs> all right. Uh, and everybody else, thank you so much for watching, and I will see you for the next one. Bye, everybody. Mm -hmm. Bye.